Okay, why don't we uh, make a start? Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, very nice to see you. Uh, welcome to the Berkeley Center for this launch event for the new issue of the Review of Faith and International Affairs, this one focused on religion and comprehensive security. Uh, my name is Judd Bertzall. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Berkeley Center and also a senior editor of the Review of Faith and International Affairs. It was a real pleasure for me to take part uh, in this project on religion and comprehensive security alongside uh, some colleagues that are here, several other colleagues who weren't able to be with us uh, in, in person today. But let me go ahead right off the bat, um, introduce those panelists who are with us, uh, either physically or, or uh, virtually. Uh, Pasquale Anakino, uh, to my immediate right, is a senior assistant professor of law at the University of Foggia uh, in Italy and also the principal investigator on this project dealing with uh, religion and comprehensive security. He'll say a little bit more about the project in general in just a moment. Um, Marco Ventura, Professor Marco Ventura is professor of in the Department of Law at the University of Siena in Italy. And uh, Christina Stockel, who is uh, behind me here uh, joining us uh, via Zoom, uh, has been a professor of sociology at the University of Innsbruck in Austria and uh, in a matter of weeks is taking up a, a position as professor of sociology at Louis University uh, in Rome. Christina, thank you for joining us uh, virtually. Um, so I, like I said, I'll, I'll leave it to Pasquale to talk about uh, the project as a whole, but let me just take a minute to talk about uh, this particular uh, special issue. Uh, in addition to our package of 10 articles on this, on this theme, it also features an article by Catherine Marshall, one of our senior research fellows here at the Berkeley Center and uh, Georgetown um, faculty. Uh, entitled uh, COVID-19 and Religion, Pandemic Lessons and Legacies. Uh, Catherine has been um, one of the key figures in looking at the intersection between religion and the pandemic over the past now three years, and I commend that article to you. There's also a, a review of Jocelyn Sassari's recent book, We, God's People, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism in the World of Nations. Uh, Jocelyn is also a, a research. Uh, Dennis Hoover, who's the editor of the review, is not able to be with us in person today, but in his stead, he sent us a box of uh, these uh, hard copies, so feel free uh, to take one. Um, so the, the, this issue has 10 articles dealing with the theme of religion and comprehensive security. Today we'll hear uh, about uh, religion and climate, religion and surveillance, religion as it relates to the Russian concept of, of spiritual security. Uh, I wrote a piece looking at the obstacles to a greater embrace of comprehensive security among evangelicals, both nationally and uh, Pasquale and I wrote the, uh, a short intro essay that helps to set the table uh, for uh, this theme. And that piece opens with an anecdote uh, from my time at the State Department when I was serving in Hillary Clinton's policy planning staff. It hurts me a little bit to bring up a, a sort of negative anecdote, but it fits so well with our theme, so I decided um, we would use it. But it, it, um, it was back in 2009 when Hillary Clinton made her first trip to China as Secretary of State. And uh, on that occasion, she told reporters that the United States does raise human rights concerns uh, with the Chinese uh, government, but quote, those issues can't interfere with the global economic crisis, the global climate change crisis, and the security crisis. And I was serving, like I said, on her policy planning staff uh, at the time, and my colleague who covered China, his response was, yeah, she got that about right. And my colleagues in the Human Rights uh, Bureau at the State Department and in the wider human rights community um, were really, really disappointed by the way in which Clinton framed the issue of, of interfering with these other issues. <coughs> now, it's always tempting to interpret people in the best possible way or the most negative way, depending on what we think about them. Uh, but if nothing else, Clinton's comments uh, remind us that it can be really hard to conceptualize and articulate the way in which human rights, including religious freedom, intersect, uh, relate to uh, all these other issues, environment, economics, military security, and so on. Uh, so in my own work, as someone who, who works on religion, works on religious freedom, I've been really grateful to the OSCE for their concept of comprehensive security and grateful to the colleagues here who have uh, help to, to further uh, articulate this relationship between religion uh, and comprehensive security. Uh, according to the, to the OSCE definition uh, and concept, human rights, including religious freedom, as well as economic issues, environmental issues, military issues, uh, they can all be part of a mutually reinforcing package of comprehensive security. So it's not about interference, it's about interdependence of all these things. And to help us uh, further explore uh, all of that, 
I'm joined by three uh, Italy-based scholars today who I've uh, introduced already. Uh, I'm convinced that Italy produces more scholars of religion and international affairs per capita than any other nation in the world. <laughs> uh, I've never tried to empirically verify that, but it, it feels true. Uh, it certainly has been true in my career. Um, my, my number one professional policy is always say yes to Italians because uh, good things come when I have collaborated uh, with Italians. They're usually hosting me over there. I never say no to a trip to Italy, so it's very nice to reciprocate for once and um, uh, host my Italian colleagues uh, here. So I want to turn it over to uh, Pasquale, who will talk about the project in general, uh, and then his article on surveillance, then Professor Ventura on religion and the environment. Then we'll go to Zoom with uh, Professor Stockel and try to use uh, about 25 to 30 minutes of our time together uh, in, in Q&A. And we'll finish at 1.30. Um, but feel free to stick around uh, after that, and we can chat uh, informally uh, on any of the topics that are raised uh, during our time. So again, thank you for being here, and let me uh, hand it off to uh, Professor uh, Anakino. Many thanks, Judd. Uh, many thanks to Georgetown for... Uh, can you hear? Yeah. Many thanks, Judd. Yeah, okay. And many thanks to Georgetown for uh, inviting us here. It has been uh, not a very long project so far, but I assume that it will be longer as we move forward with this first important step. Uh, uh, allow me to thank also the BYU Law School, especially in the person of uh, Brett Sharps, the director of the Center for International Religious Studies, which supported us through this. Uh, this uh, special issue comes out of a workshop that we had in Oxford last July. It was generally supported by BYU, so we should uh, also acknowledge that. And also, as a co-editor of this issue with Judd, let me thank all the participants to this project and all the contributors to this issue. I just want to say a few words about uh, the general project out of which this specific project is coming out, which is a project uh, which is sponsored by our university in Foggia. Uh, and uh, we have been working on this topic there as well. Professor Fattori is here also, and he's a contributor of this issue. If you want to know more about the OSHA comprehensive security, read his piece uh, in the journal. <clears throat> I have three more minutes to discuss uh, the general issue in my article. Let me start with a 1963 quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963 wrote and said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at time of challenge and controversy. And this, I think, is applicable also to the relationship between religious freedom, religion, and security. It's very easy to discuss the, rel the relationship between religion and security when the situation is easy can become very difficult when the situation is not easy and you have to balance the two. And this is why the OSHA concept of comprehensive security is particularly important because we are seeing uh, uh, globally a lot of states which are enacting legislation which are built on a very large concept of security. And the larger is the concept of security, the thinner is the concept of civil rights and among them the right to religious freedom. Uh, this is why I, I thought that this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. was uh, illuminating. In this issue, you will find a lot of discussion, especially on this balance. You will find Professor Ventura's article on the role of the environment. You will find Judd's article on the role of evangelicals. You will find an article by Nausicaa Palazzo on LGBT rights, comprehensive security, and religion. So very challenging topics, not easy, easy topics. You may agree or disagree with them and with their solution, but we decided to engage with the topic. Uh, and the OSCE perspective is particularly important today, as we will probably hear from Professor Christina Stockel, because the OSCE is probably the last uh, or international organization where Russia is still part of. So uh, it's particularly important, the kind of concepts which are developed there. Because as we say, ideas are not just ideas. Ideas have consequences. And therefore, one of the concepts that Christina Stockel will discuss, like the concept of spiritual security, it's having, it's having immediate concepts, uh, immediate effects in Russia, internally and externally. Uh, just a few words on my article. Uh, the last few years have been uh, uh, studying quite a lot the impact of uh, the digital on religion and on the relationship between uh, religion and security. Today, as we stay here, the US Supreme Court is having oral argument on one of these cases on Section 230 which might have, uh, uh, again, national and international impact on how 
we understand the relationship between internet, anti-terrorism, the roles of internet service provider, and so on. So it's very actual, this. Uh, we find that uh, the, digi the relationship between digital and religion is today a global issue. There are states which are using the digital to monitor, surveil, and profile religious groups. Uh, China, for instance. Uh, if you look what has been going on in Iran, you see that the Iranian government has been using facial recognition technologies to try to discover the women that were not wearing the hijab and putting them into jail. So my main claim is that uh, the digital changes, and changes a lot, uh, the way in which we protect civil rights, we should protect civil rights and religious freedom. So I think will be one of the topics of the future, and this is why uh, we decided to engage with that. With that, I conclude, and I look forward to a positive conversation with all of you, and I'm happy to leave the floor to Professor Matthew Ventura yeah. for his main questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here and uh, grateful for this opportunity and the invitation from the, the Berkeley Center. Um, the uh, starting point for my article on uh, religion and the environment and security is that we have uh, uh, two uh, movements which are pretty separate most of the time. One is the movement for religion and peace and religion and security, which is of course, which has rapidly evolved and is still very dynamic and growing. And on the other hand, we have an also dynamic and, and growing movement for religion and the environment. So my point with the article is how uh, is it possible and even necessary for the two movements to combine and to work together? In other words, how is it possible to have religious groups and religious resources to be mobilized for a conversation and an action on environmental security, on the environment and security combined, which is most needed today in the face of the growing emergency of, of climate change and the impact of climate change on security at a global level and a local level. So that's the, the starting point for, for, for my work here. Uh, and uh, I've been looking through some examples, uh, Religions for Peace, uh, Faith for Earth Initiative of the United Nations uh, Environment Program, um, the um, Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, but also some, some, some scholarly work, which I will mention in a, in a second. And uh, what I come up with in the article is uh, a... Um, an analysis based on a cycle, a process through which religious actors uh, are mobilized in terms of literacy on environment and security uh, in the first place. So literacy is the first phase of, the, of, the, of, of this process, of this transformational process, literacy. Dialogue, the second phase, and an action, and I will say uh, now something more about the, the three phases. Now, um, literacy is of course about knowing more uh, within religious groups about the interconnection between the uh, environmental emergency and, and security, but it's also of course about the community of security and the community of the, on the, of the environment to know more about what religious uh, 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 communities can actually can do uh, uh, and are already doing. So this is the, 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 literacy, the literacy side. And I uh, 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 mentioned both Religions for Peace and the Faith for Earth Initiative as being uh, pretty uh, uh, outspoken on, on, on this. The, the, the first commitment in this area is about literacy, literacy about religious resources which could be mobilized and at the same time literacy about the emergency within religious communities. And then we have dialogue, dialogue at different levels, interfaith dialogue of course, but in, in the article I uh, uh, stress a lot the importance of dialogue and discussion within each of the religious tradition and I give the example of the Buddhist uh, uh, discussion 
based on a, a, a book by David Loy. The title is Ecodharma. And David Loy is uh, very concerned in the book about the need within the Buddhist tradition and the Buddhist communities for a dialogue uh, uh, on the uh, prioritization of individual salvation over the collective destiny, which he sees as crucial in terms of mobilizing Buddhist resources uh, in the interest of a, 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 a suitable response to the crisis, uh, the environmental crisis. Uh, um, and then the third, the third phase is, is, is action. And there again, we can observe a lot of uh, uh, experiences, a lot of examples where uh, religious individuals and religious groups uh, take action. And I'd like to mention here a book edited by Evan Berry, a very recent book from, published in, 2000, uh, uh, in, in, in 22. And the title is Climate Politics and the Power of Religion, which is pretty telling in terms of the conversation moving towards stressing the power of religion, what, what, what can be done actually by religion. So, I've uh, uh, presented the, the, the three phases of what I define as the transformational process, literacy, dialogue, and action in, in descriptive terms. What's already there, and what needs to be seen in a way and, 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 and described. But of course, and I conclude, the three phases are all, can also be seen as prescriptive. That's what we need, where we need to improve. That's where we all challenge at the different levels and where religious groups are challenged as well in terms of what should be improved or what should, should be produced uh, uh, more and better for uh, a better uh, a conversation on religion and the environment, religion and security, and religion and environmental security. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for your uh, remarks. And again, we can come back to surveillance and climate in, uh, in our Q&A. We want to turn now to uh, Christina Stokel. Um, share her thoughts on uh, Russia's uh, concept of spiritual security and its uh, dire implications uh, right now. Uh, many thanks to my uh, events colleagues here at the Berkeley Center for putting this all together, including uh, arranging this. Thank you very much for having me, even if only online. Um, in this special issue, my article was about Russia's special security doctrine as a challenge to European comprehensive security approaches. The Russian national security doctrine of 2000 was prepared by the first presidential administration of Vladimir Putin, and it introduced the connection between national security and spiritual moral values for the first time. It included protecting the cultural and spiritual moral legacy and the historical traditions of all Russian peoples. It also included the banning of foreign religious organizations and missionaries. And in all subsequent iterations of the national security concept, that is 2009, 2015, and 2021, spiritual moral values were mentioned as integral part of Russia's national security strategy. And if you follow today the speech by President Putin, um, we see again that this is a recurring theme, the defense of Russian spiritual moral values. Now, what, what, does, what does it really mean? The list of spiritual moral values that can be distilled from the various legal documents is bundled together by a priority of collective aims over individual freedoms. These collective aims are understood as being in competition with individual rights and freedoms. Some of the goals associated with these traditional values recall former Soviet values like solidarity, moderation. Others, political values, like power, nation, patriotism. Other, religious values, like faith and mercy. And others yet, moral values, like loyalty, family, and love. None of this is by itself particularly Russian. These are common human values with some noteworthy omissions, like freedom and human dignity. What makes them Russian in the discourse of spiritual security is the construction of a friend-enemy scenario, according to which these values are under threat from the West and from liberal opposition inside Russia. Now, it's important to remember 
that around the same time when Russia made spiritual security a central element of its national security doctrine, the member states of the European Union, the OSCE, the UN Commission on Human Rights, and the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom all turned their attention to questions of religious freedom in the context of global security. So the comprehensive security doctrine, which is the topic of the special issue, was innovative because it defined security, comprehensive security, as being respectful and inclusive of individual human rights. The older or the rival understanding of the relationship between individual rights and security is that these two are in conflict with each other, with each other. that there has to be a trade-off between individual rights and freedoms and national security. And this idea of trade-off is what informs the Russian position. This is also how we can understand that foreign religious actors, religious missionaries, as they were called in the 90s, were bound to be excluded or bound to be seen as a threat to Russian national security. Now, between 2000 and 2015, we see that there is like an expansion of what counts as the spiritual moral values of Russia that need to be protected. What was originally meant primarily a concept against unlimited religious freedom came to include all sorts of measures, boosting demography through the promotion of traditional family values, combating extremism, um, promoting harmonious inter-ethnic relations inside Russia, defining moral guidelines for Russian foreign policy, combating foreign agents on the level of civil society and media. So the concept over a long period expanded. Today, again, I come back to the speech by Putin. Um, it's sort of radically shrunk again, because it's now always shorthand, just mentioned in terms of we have to defend, defend Russia against the West with its LGBT rights. From the point of view of the state, the spiritual security doctrine served the purpose of providing the state's security services, so the FSB, the follow-up organization to the Soviet time KGB, with a moral mission. And a very emblematic um, event in the year 2002 made that clear. It was the inauguration of a chapel in central Moscow on the territory of the Lubyanka, which are the headquarters of the FSB. And if you just see or recall who was present at that inauguration, it was the FSB director, Nikolai Patrushev. It was Patriarch Alexei at the time. And so it was a union of um, civil or of state authorities and church leadership. And 20 years later, um, not only do we still have um, Patrushev in power and a new Patriarch, Kirill, also this architectural um, expression, emblematic expression of the closeness of state and church has been reproduced with the building of the cathedral of the Russian armed forces that was inaugurated in the buildup of the war against Ukraine. Now to conclude, I will just stress that the national sp sp spiritual security doctrine has translated to the inside, so vis-a-vis -vis Russian society, into a quasi-totalitarian control of civil society, media, and academia. Starting in 2012, laws in the name of traditional values and against the influence of foreign agents have severely restricted freedom of expression and information in Russia. With the beginning of the war, or in Russian terminology, it's still a special military operation. The repression and crackdown on critics of the regime has increased. Having said this, however, it is also important to recognize that the Russian state propaganda about Russia's uniqueness and special mission in the world to defend tradition, Christianity, family, and normalcy 
against liberalism, progressivism, secularism, and rights for homosexuals and transsexuals finds a positive echo among large parts of the Russian population. The Russian war in Ukraine, which started in 2014 and escalated in 2022, has clarified the stakes of Russia's spiritual security doctrine. It leads to repression to the inside and to war with the outside world. Russian politicians, security agencies, and religious leaders who developed the national security strategy never concealed their deep conviction that Ukraine was an integral part of the Russian world and that controlling Ukraine was a vital interest for the nation's spiritual security. In fact, it's not only about Ukraine, it's also about Belarus. The Russian Belarusian Union document also defines um, spiritual moral values as a ground for, for political union. In his speech at the beginning of, of the invasion, but he repeated it today, Putin justified the special military operation as necessary to protect Russia from harmful Western influences, I quote. They sought to destroy our traditional values and force on us their false values that would erode us, our people from within. The spiritual security doctrine, and it's important to remember, it's been around in those very terms for 20 years already. It has become the justification for Russia's war in Ukraine and in an enlarged perspective with the West. So thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, again, for joining us uh, virtually and sharing those remarks. We are ahead of schedule, which is uh, remarkable. Um, so ample time for Q&A. And again, we don't have to, um, we'll, we'll conclude formally at, at 1.30, but we uh, can feel free to stay and, and, and chat informally uh, after that. Imogene is going to have a, a microphone um, roving, so make sure that you wait to ask your question until you have that microphone so that Christina can hear us and the video um, can pick, uh, pick up your audio. Um, who'd like to ask the, the first question? I have one for Christina. Did maybe, maybe just get things going and be thinking about your question. Um, Christina, one of the interesting things in your article and also your book, which is, has come out or will be coming out soon, is the irony that you touch on about um, these supposed moral values that Putin and Kirill have touted, that not only are they not distinctly Russian, that you, you point that they actually are quite Western, despite all the anti-Western uh, rhetoric uh, coming out of Russia. Could you just talk a little bit about uh, that irony? Thank you very much for the question. This is indeed a part I left out of my presentation for fear of going too long. But um, it is true that during the 1990s, um, Russia and the entire former Soviet region became the goal of evangelical and Protestant missionary groups, many of which from the United States. And these foreign missionaries were depicted by the church at the time as spiritual colonizers who were threatening the cultural identity of Russia as an Orthodox nation. And it was the Russian Orthodox Church that was first alarmed um, about the situation and lobbied for the 1997 law on religious freedom um, to be implemented. And that made it more difficult for groups, religious groups from the West to be active in Russia. But the exclusive focus on this as a religious freedom question hides a more complicated issue and namely that the influence by Western Christian groups took not only the form of conversions, but it also included the teaching of conservative Christian right ideas and spiritual moral doctrines that had hitherto not played an important role in the Orthodox Church social teaching. These doctrines, chiefly abortion and traditional family values outlasted the effect of the stop on foreign missionaries. American Christian right groups promoted Christian values as the cure to decades of Marxism-Leninism. And they brought new ways of thinking about ills that Russian society was aware of, but had very little um, to, um, to sort of speak up against, especially the Russian Orthodox Church, divorce, alcoholism, pornography, or abortion, which were extremely widespread and were not problematized by the church prior to the 1990s. So 
what's I, what's the irony behind this is that the Russian Orthodox Church and Patriarch Kirill have denounced spirit as spiritual colonizers, Western Christian influences, but at the same time, they have actually overlooked the much more pervasive colonization, one could say, of religious teaching that the church was undergoing and in fact was welcoming. So here we have the story of an entanglement of the Russian Orthodox Church social ethics and the Western culture wars. And that's exactly the topic of the book that you mentioned, the moralist international Russia and the global culture wars. Um, so I think, I think it's very, you know, there's, this is also one of the reasons why Russia has tried to capitalize on its role as a leader of conservative Christian values in the world. And a lot of conservative Christian actors in the West have fallen for that leadership role of Russia. They've actually found it attractive. The fact that Russia would pass a law um, against gay propaganda found a lot of even positive echo in the West. Um, in the book, we trace a lot of contacts um, between Christian right groups from the US, but from also from Western Europe and, and Russian actors. So this is an important part of that traditional value story inside Russia, but it's also one that now sits in a way squarely with the new front lines that have been created because of the war. Um, question here. Thank you very much. Um, Anna Seneva, I do public policy for the Church of Scientology National Affairs Office in DC. And um, I think my question is primarily to Dr. Christina, because she spoke about Russia and that's where I'm from. And unfortunately have the reality on the suppression of civil society and uh, banning of other non-traditional quote unquote religious groups and so forth. I am, my question is about public policy and accountability. It feels like we're having these religion versus security conversations um, which we had about 10 years ago and now we're kind of back in the same pub public policy arena. And the question is how do you uh, drive this pin public policy in a way that we don't fall into that slippery slope of blaming a religion for, for something? Because um, while the Russian Orthodox Church has been supportive of the war, the patriarch does what he does, I know there is millions of devout Christ, uh, Russian Orthodox believers who are members of the church. They're not part of the patriarchate and they're not necessarily of that same political mentality. So, um, but Russia, Iran, several other countries who are using religion to kind of shield their corrupt uh, agenda and support and support suppressive behaviors on the outside and on the inside. How do we, how do we pinpoint who's accountable and who's what's right and what's wrong here? And um, any thoughts on that would be very appreciated. Thanks so much for the question, Christina. Would you like to respond to that? Yes. So thank you very much for the question. I think you have analyzed the problem correctly. I mean, we we tend to look only at um, the church leadership because it's them who speak out. And in, if you look at the Russian Orthodox Church, it's, it's actually striking how little, how small the group is of people who are even allowed to speak out. It's really only Patriarch Kirill and, and very few people around him who, who speak. Um, dissent inside the church is silenced um, and believers and also priests who have spoken out against the war or have been critical, they have been silenced. Um, and the same is, of course, true, and even it's much, much worse for smaller um, religious groups um, or for groups that are already repressed in the country, like think about Jehovah Witnesses you, um, or Scientology, as you said, you know, who are forbidden in Russia as extremists. Um, so it's even harder for these people because if they now would speak out against the war, they would in a way be doubly repressed. They already belong to a religion that's not recognized, and then they're also critical of the regime. So as I said before, the spiritual security doctrine um, translates into repression to the inside. And, and that means to other smaller religions, but also to anything that is judged as not being in line with um, Russia's uh, traditional spiritual 
moral values. And I, as I already explained, you know, whatever that is, is defined by, by who is in power. A question over here. Hi, I'm Kurt Donnelly, retired from the State Department uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I've worked a lot in Eastern Europe. I'm interested in what your uh, view is on the relationship between the state and the church in Russia. How directive is the Ru Putin regime over the activities of the church? And I'm thinking especially in foreign policy and especially, again, in countries where you have a strong identification with uh, an Orthodox church. I'm thinking of Serbia, Greece, Armenia, places like that. Thank you. Okay, so I think that's again a question for me. Um, I, I think in the, in the community of scholars who study religion state relations inside Russia, um, there's a, that's kind of the, the small disagreement we have. So who commands who? Is it, is it just the Kremlin that sort of dictates the agenda of the church or is it the other way around? I belong to the second group, um, especially when we look back into the 1990s and the 2000s. I really think that it was the Russian Orthodox Church. In particular, it was this particular leadership, so Patriarch Kirill and the people around him, who were actively developing a social doctrine that would, um, in a way, give purpose to, to the church that was growing inside the Russian state. But that would also give um, reasons for the state to pick up on, on what the church was offering. It, it was a kind of production of content, of positive content for Russian foreign policy, of moral positive content, so to speak, a value agenda. And I think it was the church, we can point to the church as identifying um, the culture wars, so the, the struggle between liberalism and conservatism, very broadly defined, as their battle to engage in. And this, think about it, this is something in a way innovative because the older battle would simply have been that between orthodoxy and the, re and the rest or you know, the orthodox East and the West, a civilizational model. By identifying the culture wars, the topic of traditional values, the Russian Orthodox Church created a topic that had the potential to become transversal, conversant, a rival universalism in a way. Um, against Western liberalism. So I do actually think that um, if you go back to the 2000s, um, to the texts that the church produced at the time, um, we find the church in a way as a motor. Um, but I also do think that the balance of power has, or the balance of influence has tipped. It started already in 2012, but it definitely tipped in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the breaking out of the war in Ukraine. Because of course, the war in Ukraine and then all the dynamic that set in inside um, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine um, that then resulted also in a break of that church and a split away from Moscow, that has put a lot of stress on the Moscow Patriarchate and has put it in a losing position. So now the church, I think, is on the receiving end of the command chain and, and it is in a losing position. But if we think about back over the 20 years, um, there's that development, which I just sort of sketched out. So did you want to add anything on uh, Russia in, uh, uh, in Africa? It's, it's no, I want to add also something on this because it's state relations, but connected to the digital. Uh, Russia could be, uh, we studied this with Christina a little bit. Developments of relationship between uh, the state and the church. Because once you have developed the moral religious doctrine, then the states can kick in and saying, oh, but we don't want this content to be disseminated. So you create uh, the so-called RUNET, the laws against extremism on the internet and so on. So I mentioned China and Iran before, but Russia comes into that package as well. So it's another classical example of that. Thank you. Um, Andy Fang, student here at Georgetown. Uh, I have another question for Dr. Stockel. Um, on the idea of American Christian right values being imported into uh, Russia two decades ago, um, now I could see a, a situation in which American right groups are kind of conflicted because their values are similar to those that are now in Russia, um, but they have that overarching, uh, obviously, rejection of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So how can these... Uh, American Christian right groups sort of like balance those two ideas of 
the fact that they are now similar to the um, family values groups in Russia, but obviously are still denouncing the war. You said that their values are similar to those that are now in Russia. And, and that's not correct because the values that Russia now sort of expresses as its values and the Russian leadership put in from, from the podium like this morning or Patriarch Kirill in, in speeches, that is, that is rhetoric. But you know, I'm a sociologist. We also look at what people actually do in their lives and, and how people practice their faith. And, and there is, you know, we, we don't see these traditional values in, in Russian society. Now, many, many Russians will, when, when quizzed in the poll, say, yes, I'm Orthodox. It's between 60 and 80%, depending on the poll. But then we know that only 8 to 10% um, attend church, and most of them attend them only for important holidays. Abortion is a very widespread practice. It's not considered problematic. The Russian Orthodox Church has not tried to push for a ban on abortion because it would be widely unpopular. Um, divorces are very frequent. Alcoholism is a huge problem. You know, I think it's really, it's really important to, to see that there is, there is a, a traditional values rhetoric in Russia at work, which is extremely strong. There are interest groups, NGOs that are transnationally connected and that have benefited from state funding, but also from the funding of very wealthy oligarchs like Konstantin Malofeyev or um, Vladimir Yakunin, who have founded NGOs. Um, but there is no constituency underneath. I, my understanding of the American situation is that you have Christian right groups and they also, they stand for something. They stand for an electorate. They stand for people who will vote on, on, on those beliefs and convictions. But first of all, we haven't had free votes in Russia. But second, you, you don't have that. Um, so I think this is really uh, something that, that we have to get straight. And I also have to say that from my own field work with um, in Russia, when I, I was present at conventions where American Christian right groups would come to Russia um, and we did interviews with people there. And I, I did realize that for, for many Americans who went there, you know, they saw um, there are icons everywhere. Moscow is beautiful now. I mean, there are, you know, churches have been built and they were really impressed. They saw a country with a thriving faith on, on the outside. They thought what's, that's what they saw. But if you look at the data, the sociological data, that's not there. Hello, I'm Jane McAuliffe, a senior scholar here at the Berkeley Center. Um, and this is for, for Professor uh, Anakino. Um, you used the rather startling example of facial recognition in Iran to uh, target women, force them into hijab. Do you have other examples of digital technologies, surveillance technologies being used against Muslim groups in the West, either Europe or North America? Thank you very much for your question because it's, uh, it's pretty relevant, I say. Because my argument is also based, uh, my article, you, if you read it, you will find that there is an issue of credibility of the West on this topic. Uh, first of all, because uh, in this uh, surveillance ex or profiling exercise, you would be surprised to see how much of Western technology is used. And how much, you know, big tech companies are complicit into this. These questions immediately, the West and Western governments. Uh, but when we think about the recent surveillance of, Muslim, of Muslims, we, we think at China and Uyghurs, which is, of course, a big issue of which very few people are still talking if you think that there are millions of peoples on so-called re-education camps uh, in China. But, you know, we have seen uh, uh, Muslim surveillance going on in this country and in Western Europe. A uh, few blocks from here, yesterday I, I went to enter, a, uh, I went into a coffee and I took a picture because on the bar there was a, a poster, Stop Muslim Surveillance. You know, uh, I wrote in 2017 an article on the practices of the New York Police Department of Muslim Surveillance. Uh, there was a book published on that that won the Pulitzer Prize. Probably very few people have, have uh, 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 read and studied that book. So it's not only usual suspects or the states that we like to finger point because, we, uh, because they violate the rights of Muslims or you name it. 
we should do our own work too, uh, starting from this country or Western Europe as well. Because then if we want to criticize those who violate the rights, we will not be credible. And that's the big issue, I think, for us at this point. Hi, Dennis Lang from the International Center for Law and Religion Studies at BYU. Um, it seems like you have studied cases where governments will use the shield of security to oppress religious freedom. Did you study or did you investigate any cases where there may be dangerous or authoritarian religions that use the shield of religious freedom in an open democratic society to maybe overthrow that society and and, and what should a government do in those cases? Uh, this is to whom? To anybody? Yeah, to anybody. Start Go ahead. You know, I can kick off. I mean, in the, the issue, you will find that the, the primary focus in this relationship is on, the, on states. Now, that's a relevant question, and I can reply from the digital as well. Uh, in a few days, I will give a presentation on uh, QAnon, uh, religion and security. I mean, you, now from a, a theological and the sociolo sociology of religion perspective, we can discuss if QAnon is a religion or not. Uh, th that's open. Let's make the assumption that we can qualify it as a religion, okay? That would be a classical case where that religion has threatened democracy and civil society not only in a national scale, but you, uh, Germany at the, end of, uh, mm, at the end of December, 20 people were arrested because they belonged to the, to the movement and they were trying to overthrow the democratic system in Germany. Uh, if, you, if you look what has been going on in Brazil in the first few months, you will find connection to that. So that's for sure the other side of the, of the coin that we need to investigate. One thing is to balance state restriction but the other thing is to see how religion or religions can endanger, you know, uh, democracy, public order, uh, civil society, pluralism, and so on. And we need to find the right balance. One of the, the teachers, uh, professor, which I had uh, when I was a visiting scholar at Emory Law School, Abdullah Nahim, uh, was used to say, we need to simplify before we complicate. In this case, I would just put the question the other way around. We need to complexify before we simplify. Because this is a very complex issue which has different phases. One thing has state restriction on which international organizations like the OSCE operate, because OSCE cannot address directly religion. It's firstly participating states, which are part of international organization. But like in the article of environment from Professor Ventura, you can see also how religion can contribute to a more just, stable, and vibrant, pluralistic society. So the environment would be that case, but the, the, the hard security approach would be another. Religion can and should contribute also to public security widely understood, or they can endanger it as well. Yes, Ventura. Uh, uh, it's a challenging exercise in categorizing, right? Uh, your, your, that's what your question is, is about ultimately. It's how you locate the religious when you are confronted with dictatorial regimes who resort to security and, and, as a ground to restrict activities in society at large. And uh, where's religion there? How you, how you identify religion? And, and this is also coming back to Christina's point about the, the, the basic difference between the Christian rights in a democratic society <laughs> and in a dictatorial regime. That, that 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 makes the fundamental difference. And uh, in, in a lot of countries, in a lot of regimes, we are confronted with, with, with that issue. And we, we observe that very well when it comes to the environment, because with the environment, as, as I did in the article, it's in a sense, it's much easier to focus on religious initiatives. You know, it's like um, fossil fuel uh, investment of the Church of England, or it's, Again, uh, the examples I gave is the Interforest Rain Initiative, the Interreligious uh, Rainforest Initiative, sorry. Um, but when it comes to the conversation with governments, uh, who does what, that, that, that's much more complicated because you also have religious resources. 
that's the lesson we, we draw from the Russian example, in, in, at least in terms of methodology, because there you have a lot of what, what, what Christina said, it's, it's about religious resources being mobilized. And when you think of religious resources mobilized, it's not always easy to draw the line about who's mobilizing those resource, resources. And that's the discussion, if I understand well, from Christina about what is, what is influential, who's influential on, on whom. Because the, the, then you have the, the, the resources which are, and in the environment, it's, it's absolutely the same. I would add that we, 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 we also very much blind to a, a lot of religious responsibility. Take the end, well, the, the Ukraine war is a, an eye opener in terms of the struggle for resources, right? In, in, in a time of climate change and the environment crisis. And we're not used to locate anywhere religion in that discussion. When we discuss you know, global policies on energy and resources, religion is very much absent. If not, uh, well, uh, with maybe the exception of great ethical statement, like Pope Francis' encyclical, you know, Laudato Si, where, where you have these elements. Otherwise, when we discuss energy policies and the war, well, we, we, we don't, we, we, is, and, and the question is, is it, before, is it just because religion is not there? Is it just because religion is not influential at any, at any level? Or is it be, be because we are blind to, to the interaction? as scholars or journalists or you know, civil society uh, uh, members. So that, 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 that is the question that in, I, I also ask in the, in the article. Yeah, thanks for that question. Maybe to jump in on, on, on that one. If we're able to take the project forward, I'd love to explore that a bit further. We've, you know, you're right, that we've looked at states who use religion or religious freedom uh, somehow framed as a cover for what they want to do, repressive activity. On the other side, you do have religious groups that use religion or religious freedom as a cover for monopolistic sort of uh, social activity or harnessing uh, the coercive power of the state for their own uh, agenda. I think my article on evangelicalism at least touches on that uh, slightly. Um, <clears throat> the way in which American evangelicals in particular have used religious freedom um, as, a, as a cover for monopolistic or sort of siege mentality kind of, of, of activity. Talking about religious freedom but then also supporting the Muslim ban or Muslim communities to build mosques. Uh, one thing I highlighted in my piece was um, in 2004, I believe it was, the National Association of Evangelicals put out this big statement on their civic responsibility called for the health of the nation. And the preamble to that uh, document, it said something to the effect of, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, never before has God given Evangelicals, the power to shape policy in the most powerful nation on earth, Some, something, something like that. I mean, that was Bush era, early 2000s, a lot of optimism around faith-based initiatives and so on. Um, that line was deleted from the more recent uh, version of that statement that came out in 2018 because no one's really talking about the awesome opportunity evangelicals had to, <laughs> to shape uh, a policy. Uh, they had perhaps an awesome opportunity, and, and in, in my mind, as an insider, you know, blew it. Um, uh, in part because uh, they didn't live up to the very first um, principle uh, in that document, which was religious freedom. It was a list of, I think, seven key priorities. Religious freedom uh, on brand was, was the first one. Uh, but if it's religious freedom uh, for ourselves but not for others, um, public engagement is disappointing. Um, just as, a, as an aside, I think evangelicals have a lot to learn from our LDS friends who, um, you know, are, uh, are a minority, recognize that they're a minority, and, and want to have religious freedom for themselves and for everyone else. It's a principle rather than special privilege for one. Thank you for that question. Uh, we've got five minutes left. I see a question back there. Hi, my name is uh, Razi Hashmi. Uh, I am in the Office of International Religious Freedom at the US Department of State. Um, when we're talking about some of these issues, <clears throat> especially when it co comes to the environment, uh, when it comes to um, digital authoritarianism, one of the biggest issues is that it impacts historically marginalized communities, people of color, right? The global north, the global south, right? We don't like to divide the world, but it does impact, you know, communities disproportionately. How do you see some of the, the conversation, the, the um, research that you've done in impacting these communities specifically, and what can communities that are 
uh, leaders from these communities, how can they um, be best represented in these types of conversations and also pushing um, their, uh, their pluralism and equality forward? Thank you. Uh, great question. I think that touches on all of our work. Do you want to you start, Pasquale, with reflections on that? Well, uh, thanks for the question, first of all. I will build on some of the things that Christina said before. She said that the spiritual security doctrine has an effect inside and outside Russia. So we had a, a panel like this last week in uh, Lewis University in Rome, and Christina was also there. And if you look at this externally, and if you see, for instance, what is happening in Africa, talking about global south and marginalized community, the spiritual security doctrine, for instance, has also been picked by certain governments in Africa to restrict the rights of the people there. Uh, and there also is this issue of projecting power of the Russian Orthodox Church or the Russian Orthodox State you know that the Russian Orthodox Church has established an exarchate in Africa. Uh, you know what is the first African country that officially recognized the Russian Orthodox Church? It's Central African Republic. Uh, you know from a military point of view, basically, who is running the defense of Central African Republic? It's the Wagner Group. So you see how this is an effect, that the effect that Christina was saying internally and externally, and how marginalized community and global south, as you're saying, is buying into it, because then, because, as I said before, ideas have consequences. The anti-individual rights, anti-Western rhetoric is uh, taking track on Africa. Because the African states, when they vote in the UN General Assembly, they don't vote with Ukraine and with Western states. They vote with Russia. Uh, why? Also because we have not been credible with some of these states. So now, either we decide to become credible with them, and we decide to partner with them, on this issue, we, we decide to let them understand that it's not in their best interest to side with Russia, with which they sign uh, contracts to give the mines to them, because the Wagner, the Wagner Group kicks in. Otherwise, we will also lose the battle of ideas at the global level in the UN. And this is, the, you know, this is why this is particularly important. From, from a hard security perspective, not because we are naive and we care about civil rights and religious freedom, which we do care, but the implications are far greater than that. Yes, Marco. Thank you for your question, which is very topical. I think the Holy See is an interesting example of how the issue you point at is uh, having an effect of even restructuring the response from, from actors. And you have, at, at the Holy See level, an initiative on AI uh, in the in a global world, which has um, included a pact on a AI ethics with IBM and, and Microsoft, signed in Rome in the presence of a representative of FAO, uh, and that is uh, at the initiative of the Pontifical Academy of Life, and at the same time you have the Dicastery for the Integral Development, which is the, the best expression of the, of the rising importance of Global South within the structuring of the Catholic Church globally, which is uh, increasingly active on AI as well. These are, of course, uh, are combined efforts, let's say. But they, they, they also show how religious institutions themselves are living a, a, a dynamic of, of restructuring and, and change based on the, the agency of the, the Global South at, a, the, at a, an, an, an increasing importance of, of the Global South in terms of, uh, religious, of, of religiosity, actually, if you think of the decline of the Catholic Church in many respects in, in the West. So that, that, there's a dyna dynamic, which is also a dynamic of, 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 of where religion is actually lived uh, which has then an effect at, at different levels on the global conversation and the structure of the environment and, and security. Yeah, I just want to add one thing, which is one thing which is particularly dear to me, which is a methodological issue. Now, we as a community of scholars who have been engaged in, on this topic since uh, many years, we have a, a traditional framework that we have been used, which is a state, you know, the conversation that we, that we, are, we have already had this morning, so on one side there, is the, there are the states, and on the other side there are religions. But my question is always, is really this the ecosystem in which we operate today? 
because to the question, what do we do? The answer is that, that would immediately fall, or oh, the states or religion should do something. But my impression is the ecosystem is more complex today. I mean, I coordinate a working group in the OSC panel of experts on Forbes and tech. I mean, you cannot leave the big tech companies out of, of the ecosystem because otherwise you won't be able to do anything. So if you want to do something to protect civil rights, you need to engage with big tech companies to provide solutions that by design are respectful of civil rights. And so you see the ecosystem is becoming more complex and we need to be aware of that. And we need to be aware of the fact that the traditional categories of states and sovereignty that we have used do not necessarily work in the ecosystem in which we operate today. So this is a major intellectual challenge for all of us, but it's the best period to live in because you have to create new categories to understand what is going on in the global level. So you have a lot of space to work in it. Well, well that brings us to the end of our time. Thank you all for, for being with us uh, and for asking so many good questions. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.